is funny. Like, oh, only a mom would have this collection of things in her pocket at one time. And sometimes I like to make a game of it. Like, I mean, not all the time, but every once in a while, I'll be like, honey, you have, you will never guess what's in my pocket. What has it got in its pockets? Welcome to the 42 Podcast, where we discuss life together, looking for answers to life, the universe, and, well, everything else. Here are your hosts, Rob and Lindsay. Good morning. (laughs) Hi, hello. (laughs) I'm already finished with my first cup of coffee, and we are just starting the podcast, so if I I scream coffee break and run away, forgive me. That's cool. My coffee's cold. And half full as well, so. Well, there you go. Bravo for the the commitment. Mm. (laughs) So, I have to ask, Mm. and technically you haven't heard it yet, so you have been sitting with kind of your perceptions. How do you feel about last week's conversation? I was happy with it. I enjoyed the conversation. I think other people are going to enjoy the conversation. Phil enjoyed the conversation. So it was a good experience, and I hope we have more more like it. It was fun. I was a little nervous that you guys would, like, swamp me, like, gang up a little, like, with your education, edu- education, yeah. but that didn't happen. It was, it felt like a pretty, pretty equal, it was good. I, I had a good time. So... To borrow a line from, the guy's name is Gary Brooks. He does like a TikTok and videos for educators, except he calls it urgication. Right, yeah. (laughs) Or urgicators. Yeah. You you urgicators out there. Um, So, no, I, see, this is what I always find incredible and why I kind of go silent sometimes. There's a beauty to listening to someone who has been in pastoral ministry for a, a long time or has a, an incredible degree of education with pastoral ministries because there's this humility and I'm still working on that humility. I mean, I'm still working on kind of, I don't know. There's an interesting conversation to be had on what my ministry journey is at some point. Mm. But uh no, I really appreciated it because there was a humility he had to his education, but he was smart. He he knew where he was going with things, and when he got thrown because we went away from, yeah. he embraced it. He he was very gracious. I I really enjoyed that conversation. Me too. Even my even my ten minute blunder of am I recording? Oh look at that! No, I'm not. How was that editing? Was it hard? I left it in. Oh. I, I left it in, yeah, You so, you know, this is the weekend before that episode releases. I did the editing, and uh, because of, of how that blunder was, I edited everything last Friday, and it was, all right, I need to do this when, it, when it's fresh in my head. Yep. And what I did is I just put a, a starter to it of, hey, look, you ever hear of an ID10T error? No. Okay. Right? down you got a piece of paper yes okay if you ever get told that you have an id 10t error it's code so write down id oh yeah the number 10 (laughs) yeah there you go (laughs) it's an idiot error (laughs) yeah okay so i i just opened the podcast with that of me recording separately look i screwed up but this conversation is such value that my screw up doesn't mean we should delete that chunk of it and I, I explained kind of, here's where my head was and something I said, let's assume it was smart, but you can hear Lindsay and and Phil interacting with it. Cool. It's still of value. So I left it in there. Cool. Good for you. But you're the brave one that does the three, the three, the groups of three. I am very intimidated <laughs> to, to do three at a time. <laughs> 
that once you get it synced, it's it's not hard. So mm. I thought it was a good conversation. I really enjoyed it. Mm. But uh, starting next week, we're gonna do a thing. What is what's the thing we're gonna do? Oh, are we doing Star Wars next week by any chance? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Finally. All right. Mm-hmm. So we're going to, we're taking a break and we're going into Star Wars for a bit, which by the way, did you see the thing I sent you this week, midweek? The thing with the trailer? Yeah. The second trailer for Obi-Wan. Yes. I saw it and I loved it. Yes. It was amazing. <laughs> I am excited. Me too. I can't wait. So next week... Just because how things go episode-wise, when you and I record, it's two weeks out from the release of Obi-Wan, but the the episode will be up the week of the release. I want to uh, have it where you and I are going to speculate on what we think Obi-Wan's journey and story is going to be. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And I want to talk about... what. I think there's going to be a surprise character who I'm excited to see come back. And I want to talk about that. Hmm. Where it it, it would make sense to introduce this character, reintroduce this character. And I want to talk about that. I'm intrigued. But I'll save my intrigue for that episode. Yeah. So we're going to talk Obi-Wan next week. All right. Because that'll be fun. I look forward to that. So today, so we reviewed, or we read... The Things They Carried by Tim O'Brien. It's a novel. It says on the title page, The Things They Carried, a work of fiction by Tim O'Brien. But now some of the stuff I read, it was called a versilium, ver, ver, whatever. It was truth and story. Where did you hear that? I was reading a couple things online. I think that might have actually been the Wikipedia page. For similitude? Is that the word? Versimilitude, I think that's it. So yes, that was on the Wikipedia page for this. Because there are elements of truth in it from his experience in Vietnam. Yeah. But none of the stories are... So the way I looked at it is it's it's like a fishing story. You know, I caught a fish this big. Yeah. And every time you retell the story, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Except he is embracing that fully and just starting with... You know, the fish is this big. Yeah. And um, he says on page 203 of my edition, which I think sums up the point of the book, is he says, I want you to feel what I felt. I want you to know why story truth is sometimes truer than happening truth. Okay, so that actually jumped out at me as well when I read it. Because that's the chapter of good something, or uh, which chapter is that? Good form. Yeah, that, that whole that whole good form that he puts towards the end of the book yeah. helps bring everything into perspective where it's, okay, there's horrors that he experienced that he's not sharing, but at the same time he's crafting a narrative that is trying to convey that horror. Yeah, like there was one story he told where... This Vietnamese young man is walking along, and he lobs a grenade at him and kills him and looks at his body and what he looks like, dead, and is sort of can't can't leave. He can't move on. He, he has regret for killing this man because he was just afraid. And then he says, in the same short story, actually, that never happened. But he's tr- trying to tell us something that did happen. That he can't forget. And who knows what of that is true. Like, I, I, my, um, <clears throat> I had an English professor, <clears throat> and he said that fiction is telling the truth with different clothes on. So you're just redressing something. Yeah, and I think you see that in this book where, um, Have you ever sat with, uh, this book deals with Vietnam War veterans, but have you ever sat with someone who is a veteran who has experienced the horrors of war 
and just listen to their stories? I was really young, so I don't really remember what okay. they said. That's that's something that I've done occasionally. I've had the opportunity to do that, and sometimes it's been in a professional capacity where I've had fathers who have been in Desert Storm or the the War on Terror who have talked with me about the things they experienced and what they carry out of that, which is which can be really horrifying. And then how they begin to to try and cope with and understand that in their own personal narratives. And I see a lot of that in why and how and what this book is doing for Tim. Where no the narrative that he shares with, you know, tossing the grenade and killing the young man that may not be exactly how it happened, but something like that may have happened for him that he still carries, that he's still coping with. And and Vietnam was it was a bloody war for us. It wasn't as clear cut as good guy, bad guy. And because of the guerrilla tactics, it made it complicated. So many of the stories I've heard and this book included. Also, I realized this is the second time I've read this. I didn't I didn't remember I'd read it until halfway through when I got to that story about that G.I.'s girlfriend who came mm. to live with them and then stayed. <laughs> Started hanging out with the rangers? Yeah. The spooky guys? Yeah. What was my point? What was I saying? Oh, how much of Vietnam stories sound like a drug trip? Or sound like Alice in Wonderland bananas? Awful. Disorienting and terrible. Which I think is in such contrast to previous wars where World War II, you knew who the bad guys were because they had a swastika on their arm. You know, or even... Even Korea was kind of better, wasn't it? Wasn't it a little more clear-cut? Korea is when things started getting less clear-cut. So when uh, we had the war with the British, you know, our great war of revolution, mm -hmm. the British came over and expected that we would fight the traditional sense. The armies line up in the field and we just hurl lead at each other and see who is the last one standing. Kind of what they expected, but we, we also had the militias, and we used guerrilla tactics, and we had rifles, which extended our reach and our accuracy, mm -hmm. which we should maybe have a conversation about how we had an unfair technology, <laughs> the uh, Jaeger rifle, mm. that was used by the militias to, well, help win the war. But that can be a conversation for another day. But the British expected something that was by far a traditional war for the time. Mm -hmm. And what they got was not, and that's part of the reason they lost. In the same sense, that's what Korea starts being for us. That's what Vietnam is for us. And then by the time we get the Desert Storm and the War on Terror, we've adapted to guerrilla warfare, but we're, we're doing this thing where we're trying to win hearts and minds at the same time mm. in the middle of a war zone. And it kind of works, but it extends out the war endlessly I, hmm. going back to some of the discussion last week alexander the great moving through the known world and his expansionism is ingenious because what he did was brought war or brought peace made it your choice and then brought a cultural adaptation that was advantageous which is kind of what we're trying to do now where it's okay war but we don't have the peace side, but here's the culture and the, the democracy with some of the advantage. It, it's, it's, mm. I think there's some interesting correlations between the two. I'm rabbit trailing. I'm going to shut up. But you're interesting. You're being interesting. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but it, I think that's what Vietnam is, though. Is it's, it really is the clear defining turning point where it's the enemy is not as defined as we have ever experienced. And we don't know how to adapt to them, which is why that that whole situation is a mess. Yeah. And when we enter into it, Vietnam has been going on for 10, 15, 20 years. 
because it was really well yeah uh, i didn't even know that vietnam starts all the way back in i think it's like the 50s and it's the french who right are are you know still leaning into the colonialism mindsets and this was a colony pre world war 2 and we're going to take it back as a colony and then they get themselves in over their head and they draw more people in they draw more people in we get drawn in where did the french go did they leave and then we just stayed so as the war increases they fade they're still kind of there there's still kind of this push but i mean the whole objective of vietnam gets muddled in the politics and it's just mm. it was the french who, i think it was the french who got us started i might be a little rusty on that it boggles my mind that there was a draft in the united states for the vietnam war i can't believe it that story he tells about running away to canada and seeing that old guy in the shack that story was heart breaking ah hmm. I can't imagine really? that decision. Yeah. The fact that there's a draft for a war that you don't understand, don't agree with. Yeah, if you're all about it, cool. But a draft? I, I just see that as so... Uh, barbaric's not the right word. Tyrannical's not the right word. But it's like heading in that direction. You know? Like, sending these boys over to die... And and when they're in the wrong, probably, we shouldn't be there. It's like, ugh. I, I know that's the reality. That's the reality of our history as a nation, but I just... Well, you know, the draft is still a thing. I do, and it's I, I, it makes my stomach turn cold because I have... I can't believe it's a thing. I really can't believe it's a thing. And I think the only so, reason it should be a thing is if we are being attacked. If the United States is being attacked, I think everyone's going to enlist anyway. But I, I just hate... Have you ever watched the movie Red Dawn? Yes. I've seen both okay. of them. Okay. I like to imagine that if the U.S. gets invaded, that it, that's what it would be. Maybe. Like an entire country of soldiers? Militia? Not how I picture it. So in my mind, I picture it as an entire country of rednecks who are going to, you know, it's like what we're seeing in Ukraine, the farmers driving away with the, the tanks, things yeah. like that, where I like to envision that this is who we would be if we got invaded. Like, <laughs> hey, that's a pretty tank. We're going to hijack it. You know, it, just rednecks being rednecks in war. Yeah. That's how I picture it. Probably because I consider myself a redneck and I go, ooh, wow. You know, what What would be my Red Dawn? What would I do or be? Right. Now, I haven't asked that question for years, but that's what runs through my head. Now, it, the the interesting thing for me is when I was 18, you know, I, there was a part of me that seriously considered joining the military. I think I've told this story yeah, in your the mom. past where, you know, <laughs> your, your kept mom. hanging up on the recruiters. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Drove me nuts. At the time. And I've never shared this with my mother, so I fully expect that I will get a phone call. I love you, Mom. Hindsight being what it is, I'm glad I didn't go to the military. And I think if you really wanted to be in the military, you would have figured it out and gone around your mom. Oh, I and I know I could have, but I'm, I'm glad I didn't because that probably would have changed the entire course of my life. Yeah. I mean, you and I probably wouldn't have met. I probably wouldn't have met my wife. I would not have my children. Yeah. And I don't know how that would change who I am. So all of those abstractions out, I am thankful that my mother hung up on recruiters. <laughs> yeah. The part that I look at, and this is incredibly interesting, even with the draft still existing, is my son is 12. Yeah. In four years, probably, four to five years, there may be some recruiters who are starting to talk to him. You know, 16, 17 of, well, you could join the military. He's going to hit 18 and, you know, register to vote. And when you register to vote, you get registered in with the draft and... As a father, I look at that and I go, nope, I'm 
I'm not okay with that. I'm I'm not cool with that at all. Mm-hmm. And that perspective has changed over the years. That's changed as I've had kids. And yeah, I don't know. Hmm. My opinion is that war should be fought by the old men who started it. Yeah, and the Thunderdome. <laughs> Thunderdome! Yes! <laughs> <laughs> this book was... It was amazingly... Amazingly told. Amazingly, amazingly told. Like, I, I loved the things he had to say about... And, and it happens, like, seven times. He'll say, a true war story... And he'll finish it with some comment. And I loved those parts. I highlighted all of them. But, like, one of them was, a true war story is never moral. But then, yeah. a couple pages later, some guy is listening to a war story trying to figure out what the moral is. Remember that story about the um, the guys who went on the week-long scouting mission and they had to be completely quiet and still for a whole week? Do you remember that story? Okay. And they were they uh, yeah. started to hear music. They were hearing a symphony on the the mountain, and yes, and they called in all kinds of hellfire and yeah, yes. But the way he tells it, maybe there wasn't any music. Maybe there just wasn't any music, and they were loopy cuckoo cuckoo. But um, he says at the end of that story. Oh, he says, this next part you won't believe, said Sanders, because it happened, because every word is absolutely dead on true. I think that's really interesting. But he was always trying to find the moral in the story. He was trying to figure out the moral, because like without a moral, it had no purpose. Saunders was, not not the author. And I thought that was really interesting, cause it was, because Orion says, well... It's so funny because all his all his statements kind of loop in on each other a lot or they contradict each mm-hmm. other or he it's I just really, really cool. That's not the right word. So I, I guess this is where I want to kind of push our conversation back to the beginning of the book. OK. Because we're at a point where. Yeah. So let, let's go back to the beginning of the book. At the beginning of the book, he starts off the story, the stories. Oh, Jimmy Cross. Well, with listing everything they carried. Yeah. Everything. And this is where it's interesting because what they carry, there's conflicts Mm. in the mindsets they have and the kind of love and war of it. Right. I think that's something somebody says later in the book is it wasn't a war story. It was a love story. Yeah. Where you have these, you have the men who are very, well, they're, they're in their own narratives, their own stories, their own life. And we each have this, you know, we are all in our own life, our own narrative and how we interact, engage and grow in that. Is a huge part of what takes up all that cycling time in our heads. And that's what he starts with, is that. You know, uh, like you were saying, Jimmy Cross. He he has, what was it? It was a picture and that pebble. Mm -hmm. And the whole narrative he's crafting about the young lady back home. You know, that pebble. Was she with someone? Was she not? He wants her to be virginal and not virginal all at once. She did, 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 did. Mm-hmm. And he draws this whole narrative. And then that narrative is train wrecked by the reality of war. That is probably should have put this at the beginning, but spoilers if you haven't read this. Oh my goodness, which who who was the character that died? Was it Lavender? Lemon. Lavender died. Yeah. Lavender died in that oh, scene yeah. too, right at the end of that scene. Right. Sorry, but uh, where Lemon dies, you know, and, and in Cross's head, he's in this narrative. He's weaving around this pebble that he continually carries in his mouth. Mm-hmm. 
And then he's brought out of this love story, this hope, by death, by yeah. war. And, and that seems to be kind of this ebb and flow to each of the stories. There's hope and death. Mm. Uh, love and war. I Just in and out, in and out. Which is a beautiful and horrifying flow to it because it, it draws us to hope and then it brings us crashing down. It draws us to these are good men and then they're not. Yeah. But they're not good men because of the horrors of war that they face. Mm. So I texted you I wanted to do a little bit of an exercise this week and, and we can kind of play with with that and draw some of our own insane conclusions, if you will. What are the things you carry every day? Well, it depends on the day, but a lot of the times it's whatever I find on the floor. Like broken crayons and Lego shields and helmets and pieces of food sometimes. Um pennies what else whatever i find on the floor that i don't have time to put away i just put in my pocket <laughs> screws nails rocks uh. sticks yeah i have two boys who are constantly bringing sticks and stones into the house <laughs> and tree bark <laughs> but that's like day to day the boring answer like when i'm out is a wallet and a phone and that's it yeah yeah, I don't have I don't have a purse. All right. Well, it doesn't have to be a purse. What's on your phone then? Cuz that seems to be like one of the main things for you if you don't have a lot of other. Like what what kind of apps do you have on your phone? We don't need to go into depth of every detail. Like what do you use your phone for? My camera, my mm. camera for sure. Um my dictionary, like if I don't know words, I like to look it up on Google. Wikipedia. <laughs> yeah, Wikipedia. Audible. I listen to books all the time. My notepad. I, li I use my notepad all the time, and I love the fact that it syncs with my, my Mac. So I can be doing something on my phone, and then I can run upstairs and finish later. I love my notepad app. It's so nice. So day to day... Internet movie database, so I can look up names and like, oh yeah, that guy, ooh. Google. You gotta Google stuff sometimes. So for you then, your phone is a lot of a lot of what you carry. Because it's it's the resource you use to craft, read, understand, process, write down. That's where a lot of your energy goes with your with what you physically carry every day when you're out. Right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And, and this is where I wanted to ask this and have this conversation because it's fascinating in what we use and we carry because it's also forming what is our own personal stories. So for you, you've embraced that digital and your story is being crafted through your phone. Because it has your family stuff on it. It has family photos that you go, go back through and look at. Ah, and, and I say this because Melinda does almost the exact same thing. Her phone has a lot of the family photos, a lot of what she uses in crafting her own story, in how she processes what is the world around her. Uh, and we all do in a, in a way, because I mean, I'm I'm saying this like I'm entirely different now. My phone, my phone is a source that I use of for that, but I I do a couple different things. So the the I, I've never been able to say this word. This is why I have a pause. At the end of the day, you empty out your pockets, and you have the. Detritus, detritus, the the detritus. However, or detritus. However, you say it. Yep. Of the day, is there anything that comes and crosses your mind because of the the stuff in your pockets, the detritus in your pockets? Detritus. Whatever. I'm done. <laughs> I tried to sound smart. It's 
it's funny when I look at the weird things in my pocket. It's funny. Like, oh, only a mom would have this collection of things in her pocket at one time. And sometimes I like to make a game of it. Like, I mean, not all the time, but every once in a while, I'll be like, honey, you, have, you will never guess what's in my pocket. What has a goat in its pockets? But this is the only time in my life, probably, maybe until I'm a grandma, um, that I will have those weird things in my pocket. So it's funny and cute. And, you know, I, pre- I do appreciate that. See, and that's when you were like, oh, you know, what I carry is so boring compared to what I do. It's no. How much of because at the time I was thinking wallet and phone, you know, but I didn't think. But then as I as we started talking, like, oh, yeah, well. But how much of that narrative of you being a mother is then going back through the ages? Uh, Have you ever been looking at the stuff in your pockets and considered whichever child brought that in and the uniqueness of that child from birthing them to, you know, who they are in that moment, how they think? Mm. And again, that's Mm. what I find interesting about it. That's what I found interesting when you're like, oh, it's just boring. No, no, it's not. Because, and and I think this is where, again, the things they carried and what Tim O'Brien is doing in building that narrative, starting with what they physically carry and going into what they emotionally carry, that baggage. And my book had, uh, I never, I, I can never, what's it called when an author puts it, his bit at the end? An epilogue or an afterword? Yeah, epilogue. Thank you, an afterword. The, the version I had had an afterword from Tim O'Brien where he goes back to Vietnam and he goes with a young lady oh, named yeah. Katie, and yep. yeah, mm-hmm. and, and you see that same thing. Whether you know whether that afterward is him storytelling or telling the truth, again, it keeps coming back to the emotional things he carried, the physical things he carried, and just yeah. this ebb and flow of storytelling and processing, storytelling and processing. And that's why that's why I I wanted to do this because it's okay. What is it that is the storytelling in your life from the things you carry? Mm. And and this is a question for all of us, really. I mean, all right, here we go. This is the 42 stick up. Everybody, empty your pockets. What do you got? And I'll post a picture online of at least what is my... The 42 stick up. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I'll, I'll post a picture of what is, you know the stuff I have and at at the end of one of these days why don't you take a picture of what is in your pockets yeah and post it because you know what I sent you there are a lot of storytelling elements to what I carry yes I have dabbled in police procedural shows in the past like Bones (laughs) for instance and um yeah I always find it fascinating when they can deduce something based on, you know, an indent on somebody's bone on their left hand or um, things that they had on their person. And they have to extrapolate why those things were there or or on their person. And, And sometimes I wonder, like, oh, man, if somebody, well, what does our, basically that, I guess, is what, without getting morbid. If I couldn't tell my story, what would people think about the things in my pockets is? <laughs> All right. I sent you the things in my pockets is. What, what would you say by what I carry? All right. And, and which one of these do you want to do? Do you want to do on my person or in my work bag? Um. Oh, my goodness. Where's your person? Let's... So that's in your person. Okay. Yeah, that that's the less items. <laughs> yeah. On your person, Raycon work earbuds, custom wallet with family photo engraved on the other side, preserved five-leaf clover, a stone, so you're super sentimental, 
Zippo armor butane torch lighter. Bam. Burt's Bees chapstick. Kaweco copper pocket fountain pen. Fancy and sentimental. Cutco serrated edge pocket knife. So. All right. You have found my body lying in a street. What are you? Family man. What are you? Family man who has a job where you got to write a lot. Sentimental. Sentimental, man. Hmm. Nice guy. That's interesting. Probably a guy who would be interesting to... Not boring, I think. I think that's the thing is you don't sound boring, which is important to me. <laughs> <laughs> I I find it fascinating you keep coming to the nice guy side, but okay. You really are a nice guy. I don't care what you say. Yeah. You would love people to think you weren't, but you are a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> so... All right. I, I share this because it's funny. It is funny. Uh, a few years back, the church I'm currently working for, I got one of my students to agree to come to Creation, the big music festival that's out in central PA with our church. And uh, she agreed to come only if I would shave my head into a mohawk and dye it hot pink. And you did it, didn't you? Oh, of course I did. Of course you did. <laughs> you know, she made that statement. I was like, are you sure? I mean, that's that's a big deal. Are you sure that's what you want? She's like, yeah. that's. You shave your head into a mohawk and dye it hot pink. So I played it up and oh, whole hemmed and you know, went home, told my wife. She rolled her eyes and uh, not again. <laughs> uh, the number of times I've had a mohawk in our marriage, she's just tired of it. <laughs> so, I I did. I, I shaved my head and had a mohawk and uh, dyed it hot pink. Week after creation, two weeks after creation, what are, whatever it was, the pastor had encouraged me to keep the mohawk until we did uh, our summer vacation Bible school thing. It wasn't vacation Bible school, it was something else, but to keep it until after, which is just awesome when the pastor is encouraging your insanity. I love it. <laughs> so, but shortly after all of this, I, I still have the mohawk, and one of the sweet, loving church ladies comes up to my wife and goes, why does your husband have a mohawk? And she was trying to do it as lovingly as she could. Mm -hmm. And Melinda explained it where it was, you know, he, he did it because a student said they would come to creation if he did. And she explains all that, and the church lady goes, well, okay, I get that, but he's like this giant, cuddly teddy bear, and I don't think the tough guy mohawk looks good on him. <laughs> <laughs> Mel told me that story later. I just cracked up, because it's yeah, fine. <laughs> I like to think I'm a harder guy than I am, but... The church ladies know me. I'm a cuddly teddy bear, apparently. <laughs> I I think it's interesting when we look at what is carried. Because you get nice guy out of what's in my pockets, but I get story out of that. Where the, the five-leaf clover, I found that right before... Right before we moved. I was 18 years old, and I found that in the backyard of the house we were in. Hmm. And it was this big, weird transition time, and it was it was one of the angriest moments of my life as a young man. Mm. But out of that transition came all of this good, all of this things I needed that I didn't know at the time. And so that five-leaf clover is just a reminder of that. Mm. It might be bad, but you don't know what good will come out of it. And my sister preserved that for me, and... So that still hangs in my wallet. Uh, that stone, I carry that because of the lessons of seminary. It was the second class I did in seminary, and the professor gave us each a stone. I've since lost that original stone. But it was the life you guys are leading, not just in seminary, but life. 
you start off as this rough volcanic stone, but as you go, and, and he used, and this is probably where I got it from initially, but he used that the journey we're on is like being in a river. Mm-hmm. It's going to smooth you out. It's going to try and make you a better person. Not perfect, but a better person. From being this sharp, jagged rock that starts at the top of the stream to the smooth stone that ha- that you find at the end of the stream. And the yeah. stones he gave us were out of the Jordan River. Because he would do Israel uh, trips to Israel and get a bunch of stones and give them to the seminary students. That's cute. That's cool. Yeah, there there's narrative behind that. But even then, the fountain pen, that's like an OCD thing. I don't know. It's the tactile feel between paper and pen with a fountain pen. It's the only thing I use. I, I lose everything. I I wish I could be that person that has a cool thing in their pocket, but I lose everything. Lose track of it. So. <laughs> the the other version of that pen, by the way, I have it on my desk. I don't know where I have it. My desk is a mess at the moment. But it's one that Melinda gave me. It's I, I use that same one. Again, crafting narrative where I had that when we signed over for the mortgage. Mm. It's that pen that I used to sign. I don't know. And that's... That's just what's interesting is when you look at the things that we physically carry and then the stories that they tell from the ages. Mm. You know, I, I, how does a five leaf, a, an old preserved five leaf clover have any relevance? And it goes back to being 18. Why does a stone, why does, and what we craft of ourselves, but then even the perception of what others craft for us with the information mm. that they, they get. Yeah. Yeah. So now now that we've had you sitting here, you know, stuck up and empty pockets, you know, what are the things that you guys carry? What are the, the stories, the narratives, the moments? And I don't know. I think it's always interesting how how we craft those narratives around ourselves. Because that is what we see. And I'm monologuing here but that is what i think we see with tim o'brien's book we see the narrative he's crafting that's maybe more hopeful for vietnam yeah than what he experienced or maybe it is the true horrors of war he experienced which yeah either way yeah yeah i agree it was i think an important book to read and probably reread obviously because i read it twice Definitely, definitely recommend. And there are hard moments in it. Yes, there are. There's some pretty grisly stories. A couple, couple really grisly stories. Yeah. But we have that in life as well. The grisly moments we all face. What was the... Oh. (laughs) I'm going to quote a romance novel really yeah so i encountered another local podcaster out my way and uh we were swapping podcast information so i've been going through and listening to hers and it's called redeeming lit and uh it's talking about christian romance novels and the first two episodes of the podcast, they talk about Francine Rivers' Redeeming Love, which just came out as a movie, and Melinda read it. She loved it. I, I remember her reading it. Uh, we, I think that was early in our marriage, and I was like, whatever. Ugh. So, I listened to their podcast. It's a good podcast, especially if you're in your Christian romance. They, they... Anyway, not my cup of tea, but I listened. But there's a line in that that they they camped on for a bit and talked about where it was it you know a mile in someone's shoes may be just as hard as 30 miles in someone else's shoes huh i'm badly quoting that but you know a, a mile in your shoes may not be the same mile in my shoes interesting is <clears throat> the gist and i'm using that now to say you know there are there are those negative things that we each carry, and a mile in my shoes has negative. 
has some of those horrible stories. And you and I have privately talked with some of the things that we've gone through. Mm -hmm. But then the flip side of that, someone else may have gone through something worse or not as worse, but it's still a a hard trauma to them, a hard negative in their story. Mm -hmm. And I think understanding that, again, has value to understanding who and how and, and what we are. And that we've walked through a mile in Tim O'Brien's shoes with this book. And I'm not sure that's a mile I could walk. Because that's a pretty big mile. But I know I've had some miles that have nearly broken me. Mm -hmm. And how I carry and craft that narrative. I I don't know. I'm going to stop monologuing, Lindsay. Talk to me. It's interesting you say that because... Um, I don't even know how to talk about it, (laughs) but when you and I started the 42 podcast, I was already doing a podcast called The Defector. And in that period of my life, it was six months of my life from, from the start, I think to the finish, I was an atheist. I was looking into things that I'd been wanting to look into forever and I gave myself permission, I guess, to to go in a dark place. But I recently got an email from someone who they were looking for the Defector podcast. And I told them, well, I took it down because I didn't think it represented where I am now. And I guess... It wasn't me anymore, um, but an important part of who I of where I've been. And this person said that it was an important podcast because I did things that other people want to do or have been tempted to do and but don't have but can't. And so maybe other people need to hear the experiences I had and go through vicariously the thought processes and and uh, enable the enable themselves to ask those scary questions that have been on the back burner all your life because you're not allowed to ask them so in, in a lot of ways i can be shockingly inarticulate sometimes and i apologize it's okay that's part of what the beauty of conversation is is when when one falters we can interact and ask um, let me ask some questions, and l- l- let's see what you're thinking with it. But with this, with looking at the defector, from where you are now, uh, it's been almost a year since you put anything up with the defector, I think. Yep, just over, yeah. W- when you look at what is the product of that time, that podcast, do you feel good about it, or do you feel bad about it, in the simplest of terms? I feel bad in the sense that um, I did it in the midst of people who really loved me but didn't understand why I was doing it. We went through a really hard time then, and I do think it was necessary. However, it was not easy. It, It was a liberating thing, but it was also extremely emotional and hard and sad. My worry for people that go back is that, because I wasn't in a very emotional state, that they would assume that I am exactly that person now, but I'm not. But for you in that time, it was something that you needed to vent. You needed the process. You needed to have the space. And with what you're saying, it was negative. It had a negative effect on your family, on those around you who loved you. Mm -hmm. But it still needed to be brought out. Yeah. Okay. But that's a part of the story of who you are. That's a part of, you know, if you look at the processes of AA or counseling or healing or anything that's trying to go back and bring a generational or even a spiritual healing or physical healing, there's this aspect of making peace with who you are and making peace with 
the past, whether it's apologizing or understanding or, 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 or. <clears throat> and I think that's a lot of what the, the factor did for you is it allowed you, yeah, it hurt, but you needed to get that venom out. You needed to get where you were out to make, to make sense of it all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so long term, I, I think it's been good for who you are. I think it's been good for your healing. Yeah. And in a, in a goofy way, I still think of you as a defector, but not in the same sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I do. I think, like, I look at your interactions with Phil and I last week, and you're challenging and you're pressing and not so much in the conversation and not in a negative manner, but you're asking questions that people are sometimes scared to ask. Right. You're exploring belief in ways that sometimes people are uncomfortable, including me. Yeah. At a couple of points in our conversation over what was the past two months. But there's balance to that and value to that. Which is why I still look at you as the defector, because it's you're going to challenge, you're going to ask. You're not going to march in the line of, this is the way we go. I think something that the defector did for me was it helped me realize that I, I, I'm, not the sm- I'm not the smartest person. I don't have the highest IQ, and I bumble through things, but I am an intellectual person. I'm very academic, and I love reason and logic and order. But before the defector... Things that didn't make sense in Christianity, things that seemed like contradictions in in the way we talked or hypocrisy or all that stuff, I had to just shove so far down and it bothered me so much for decades until I could finally be who I am and ask the freaking questions and suss it out for myself to whatever conclusion I came to. That's what the defector did for me. And so from here on out, I want to keep my who I am and still be an intellectual. And if things don't make sense, I want to admit it. Or if things contradict it, it's, I, I, okay, let's find an answer. Instead of just, oh, well, God knows, and we'll never know this side of heaven, and blah, blah, blah. So anyway, I guess as negative as it, a time as it was for me, it liberated my brain. And I don't know, my soul, I guess, or something. It, it it allowed me to be me and to stay me. Which is, I think, the chief thing I took away from it. Now, I'll, say, I'll, I'll add this in. Kind of bringing us back around, maybe. The value of the defector is that it is a chapter in your life. Yes, definitely. Because... As you were doing the Defector podcast, you were also doing the 42 podcast. And you publishing the Defector actually had me finally pull the trigger on what was that first episode. Because it was, okay, if Lindsay can figure this out and do it solo, I can figure out how to do the edits, make it sound palatable, and do it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. And and it, it is. It's part of what finally got us to publish on the 42. Yeah. And here we are. Yeah. So the defector is a chapter of who you are and what you have been. And who we are. But it's one that, right, it's one we've not incorporated in as well recently. Mm. Now, it's your chapter. It's your story. We talked a little bit about how we can unfold that in, what we can do with that. This isn't anything we're immediately doing. We're looking at options. You're looking at how you want to do it. Mm -hmm. But bringing those episodes over and having them as something additional on the 42 for a period of time so that they're there. They still exist. But you talking through it initially, introducing where you were at and how – and this is a work in progress. This is is not happening tomorrow, but soon? Something we've been tossing around, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because 
I told you this earlier, you know, you put up the defector and it was an inside track for me with what you were thinking, what you were feeling, and kind of what I could, at the edges of things with this podcast, pick at with you and draw out and discuss. And there are even a few episodes in there where you're reacting to me. <laughs> yeah, there is. <laughs> in a way. Yeah. Where you're like, I'm so angry because these wild, weird Christian people. <clears throat> Rob. Slash Rob. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And in a way, it's embarrassing now because it's so unfettered. It's so raw. It's so raw. Embarrassing's a strong word, but, that's, but it's like it's like public. But that's just it. <laughs> and, and this is where, you know, going back into the things they carried and storytelling, what Tim O'Brien is sharing out of those experiences. That's raw human. Mm -hmm. It's it's messy. It's ups and downs and yeah. it brings grief and happiness all in the same sentence. And you don't know what to do with it because it's just it's it's that raw. But there's also valuable stories to tell because we all have those raw moments. So do we bury them? Do we talk about them? And, and with what you did, you talked about it. You opened the door. Here's my raw humanity. In all of its beauty and disgusting. So there's still value to that story being a part of who you are. It's just, well, maybe we go back. Well, maybe. If we do anything with the defector on this podcast, th that's going to be a you thing unless you invite me in. Because that's your story. That's your your narrative that you're wrestling. So, you know, if we go back, it'll be you unless you invite me in. I, I like the idea of coalescing the two places because it's the two places I've been. Um, so I, I like the idea of possibly having a revisiting the defector episode whatever um title yeah and and we'll figure that out just logistics with the the editing the moving the uh what days they go up and our podcast hosting system and mm. but that's something that may be coming soon because this is still a chapter in your life mm -hmm. that is valuable it's not the prettiest it's okay. We all have those. Mm -hmm. But it's still worth telling. Part of the narrative. <laughs> it's part of the things that I carry. Right. And and I think that's where the beauty and the value of this podcast I is even. Because in a way, it's us processing through some of the things that we have carried, are carrying, and will carry. Yeah. While trying to create a bar-like atmosphere with coffee, apparently. <laughs> yep. And, you know, having fun, laughing, taking the diversions when we need them, which is Star Wars. Sorry. <laughs> yep. If you're a Star Wars fan, we love you. If you're not a Star Wars fan, we love you. All right. But now, now. Anything else you want to say with that? I just appreciate it. You're so good at making me sound coherent. You're good at asking the questions that get me to be more cohesive because <laughs> I struggle with being cohesive. <laughs> Thank you. All right. That's, that's the fun of this podcast because I can, I can process through something with someone, but I can't do the big words like you can. <laughs> Which is always neat. <laughs> I don't know. I like to think I'm an intellectual, but I'm a humanist. I, I think that's the way to phrase that. Of, <laughs> yeah. I, I understand people. Yeah. I read people. I don't always read the higher words well. They're higher education than I'm <laughs> capable of. Yeah. <laughs> There's that Western pencil talkie in me that just, I'm going to use the simple words. <laughs> Yep. Not the big ones. But I appreciate what this podcast is, so thank you. All right. Guess what? What? I get to pick the book. Yes. You're the next book club book. <laughs> yes, I do. 
And uh, I have been thinking about this one because there's a part of me that's like, oh, we could do this one and this would be a great in-depth discussion and really good. Or I could do this one and it's just, it's a big book, but it's a good sci-fi fiction book. Hmm. Discussion or fiction? Can I know the titles beforehand? No. No. Well, how big? How big's the book? How long? Uh, it's a 30-hour listen on Audible. Now, I wouldn't say we do this until, like, August. That's really long, because I just read Nelson Mandela's uh, thing. I listened to it, and that was 26 hours, and that was 600-plus pages. Okay, so in... Where are we? We're in May. In April, I said, ooh, this seems like it might be an interesting book. Uh, it seems like it's the American version of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Oh, is this Neil Gaiman? I'll read that. Uh, no. This is, uh, oh wait. No, David Foster Wallace, Infinite Jest. Okay, let's just, what if we count this as two books? So what if we... D- no. Yes, that's what no. we do. Yes. No. Come on. No. I don't want to re- I, I... <sighs> this is like the sci-fi book that I have in mind is like a you 100% you book. Okay. I've been trying to get my wife to read this. Infinite Jest. No, 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 not Infinite Jest. No, gosh, no. That's like a 60-hour book. I haven't finished that. Okay. I have, what book are you I'm... talking then? Tell me the book. Okay. Sorry, tell me the book. So you're choose you're choosing sci-fi? I I like sci-fi and your, the last discussion book okay. that you made me read, um, it got us all up in a tizzy, so I don't know if I trust you. <laughs> What's the other? Can you just tell me the other book? Tell me the other book. If it's of any help, the discussion book I picked was with that one in mind, the Jesus and John Wayne, yeah. and it was, yeah, I'm not doing that for a while. I still need to recover from yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> like. Uh, I'm having panic attacks yeah. from that. Uh, what, book? what book? So that discussion book is the, my discussion book is based in a historic discussion of a people group and how they have helped invent the modern world. Oh, I know what book you're talking about, Coming and up. I think I've read that. Let's do sci-fi. Okay. I love the Scottish or All the right. Irish or wherever you're going, but I let's do sci-fi. <laughs> Sorry, no offense. All right, fine. <laughs> The discussion book would have been How the Scots Invented the Modern World. Yeah, Fine. that's a good book. I've read that. We're not doing that one. Okay. It is. I am... Yes. So, all right. Sci-fi, what is it? We're going to read, then. We're going to read Seven Eves by Neil Stevenson. Seven, like the number seven Eves, as in Christmas? As in, or like, Eve. Roof. Adam and Eve. Oh, Okay, seven eaves. And it is one word. Oh, goodness sakes. So complicated. Seven eaves by who? Neil Stevenson. Okay. Yes. So, seven eaves, Neil Stevenson. It is a big book, but it is a fun, interesting, like, it's the end of the world. I like those kind of books. This is a you book. Okay, cool. And it's really, it's in the title, Seven Eves. Is this an alternate time, alternate like timeline jumping type thing? Because I, oh, I love that topic. Okay. No, this is, this is linear. No time travel. They do have like a time jump where they're like, okay, you know, here's where we end. Now we're going to go 100 years into the future. How does this all play out 100 years later? Here's the thing. And this is this is what I enjoy. It is sci-fi, but it's, it's sci-fi like, hey, this could happen today with our technology, and this is what we could do. So today, our technology, what we could do. But, yeah. Seven eaves. Seven eaves. Seven eaves. Okay. Ooh, 3.99 on Goodreads. That's good. 880 pages. I said it was a big book. Goodness. But it is worth it. Okay. Well, that's going to take the, the prize as the longest book of the year because I thought Mandela was going to yeah. be the longest book. 
but definitely cool. Well, thanks. I uh, no, really, I'm excited. This sounds good. Did have you read the description? Read the description. Okay. Or read a review. Pick one. What would happen if the world were ending? A catastrophic event renders the Earth a ticking time bomb. In a feverish race against the inevitable, nations around the globe band together to devise an ambitious plan to ensure the survival of humanity far beyond our atmosphere and outer space. But the complexities and unpredictability of human nature... Coupled with unforeseen challenges and dangers threaten the intrepid pioneers until only a handful of survivors remain. I'm sold. I'm in. I, this is a you book. Cool. 110%. This is a you book. I read this a couple of years ago because one of the podcasts I listened to, they, they talked about this book and I was like, Oh, okay. This sounds interesting. And I enjoyed it. Cool. Looking forward to it. I really enjoyed this book. I mean, it's disturbing. I like disturbing. You can't look at the night sky the same. I mean, it, it kind of hits you where you're like, Ugh. does it hit you in the, that, that... uh, don't look up area? <laughs> not, not in, not in that same way. There are elements of that in there, mm. but not in the same way. So cool, looking forward to it. Yeah, it's it's a good book. Wow. I got to think of a really long book to pay you back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm suffering with with infinite jest, so please know. Okay. Well, I got to go see what the fam's doing and join the familia. Yep. But it's been good. So, it's been a good one. Hey, yes, it has. And this this was a good book, Lindsay. So thank you for picking it. You're welcome. So, And to everyone else, thank you for listening along, hanging out with us. We really appreciate and enjoy your company. So thank you. Bye-bye. So, bye. Thank you for listening to the 42 Podcast. Please take a moment to like and subscribe. And if you want to join in on the conversation, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter to add your voice to the conversation. Thank you.